Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time for worship today. This is not my usual uh, setting for recording the sermons. Um, let's just say I love technology and sometimes technology loves me, sometimes it doesn't. So we're going to use this approach. Uh, we're looking at Second Thessalonians for this week and next, and um, we're looking at that for a distinct reason. We, um, before Easter, uh, a month or so before Easter, we finished up looking at First Thessalonians, and, and we wrapped up, and Paul had sort of chatted with that church, and uh, then he has to write them again. And so coming back to Second Thessalonians, or coming back to this same church in the same context, uh, makes sense, because Paul had to come back to it. And so we're going to come back to it and take a look at it, where they're at. Um, uh, a brief announcement before we uh, jump in. Uh, this is the Sunday that we are beginning worship uh, without masks, still continuing to use social distancing and other precautions. And so uh, I'm excited for uh, being able to see people's entire faces uh, today. So that, that will be a good thing. Uh, and we are asking that if anyone has been traveling, um, if you go to another major city, uh, Columbia, St. Louis, Kansas City, something like that, please use a mask the next um, Sunday when you're in worship. So uh, we're going to jump right in. What would be the modern version of beating a dead horse? Uh, I was pondering this. Um, the, the meaning of this phrase comes from when uh, everyone used to get run by horses. And, and uh, to get a horse to move faster, you could take a whip and you could hit or beat the horse and whip it, but beat it if you really wanted it to go faster. And um, <clears throat> if you you could ride a horse to death, and uh, if you kept on, if you rode a horse to death because you were beating it so hard to try to get it to go faster and faster, if you beat it more, you weren't, you weren't going to get anywhere, right? You're beating a dead horse. You're not going to get anywhere doing this. I, I don't know if there is a modern corollary to this uh, statement. Uh, it would be something like, uh, flooring it while the, when the gas tank is empty, but doesn't have quite the same ring to it. The challenge of uh, working with someone who's beating a dead horse is uh, how do you get them to stop? Like, how, how does that work? How do you get someone to stop without just like being rude and, and just saying, stop it, right? Uh, that is the challenge that Paul is facing today uh, as he is writing this short letter, this letter that we now know as 2 Thessalonians. Uh, the church is continuing to obsess, the church at Thessalonica is continuing to obsess about something that uh, <clears throat> they've been worried out for a while. He has, he had taught them about it when he was there, he taught them for weeks. And then he had sent Timothy to check on them, and I'm sure Timothy had talked to them about it. And then Timothy came back to Paul and said, hey, this is the situation there. And then Paul had written what we now know as 1 Thessalonians, a letter to them, and addressed this topic. And now Paul has gotten another report, and they're still obsessing. And so this is like round four of Paul trying to like work through this with them. <clears throat> and um, they are focused on this topic in an unhealthy fashion. Talking about it further is not helping. The particular horse that they're beating, uh, that, that's having such a bad day, this, this horse, is, is the topic of uh, death and when will Jesus uh, come again? It, it's a worthy topic, obviously. It's something that matters. Uh, and in the first letter to the church, Paul had reminded them that they do not face death as people who are without hope. No, they face death as people who have hope, and so they can look to Jesus, can look at what has happened in, in the death and resurrection, and they can see that there is hope that they have to hold on to. That when the time comes, everyone who follows Jesus, those who have fallen asleep, will all be gathered, and they will be part of uh, responding to that, and, and, and part of what, what happens next. And so Paul wraps up in his first letter, First Thessalonians, he wraps up this moment of explaining this to them again. And he says, and encourage each other with these words. And uh, he's trying to reframe how they're talking about this. He, he, he doesn't say to them, now obsess about this some more. I've given you more to obsess about, so please obsess. Continue, hash, hash, just keep on hashing about this ad nauseum. Just keep on just hashing about this. Now, he says, he doesn't say to them, now nah, I told you once, now nah, I told you twice, now drop it. That, that's where I 
be tempted to land personally. Um, no, he does something different. He says, I, I, I uh, encourage each other, right? He's trying to get them to do something healthy, to take something they're, they're obsessing about in a negative fashion and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving you a way to use this to build each other up, encourage each other with this news that we not grieve as those who are without hope. We grieve as people who have hope. So encourage each other. You don't need to obsess. Just have faith and hold on to this. Right? And by the way, like it's not like we're going to know when this happens. It's going to come like a thief in the night. That's how he talks about next. And that may have been an unfortunate choice of, of imagery for Paul, I must confess. I, I'm, I'm loath to critique people in Scripture too often. The authors, I, I wasn't there. But uh, if you're trying to help people not obsess a bit more, comparing anything to uh, a thief in the night may not have been your best tactical decision. Yeah, that's what he did. The good people of the church of Thessalonica did not take the hint. It really wasn't a subtle hint. It might have been more of a shove. But either way, they didn't take it. And uh, they found more ways to obsess. And Paul finds out about this. He can't get to them in person. He doesn't have anyone else to send. And so he sends a letter. And he attempts to do something rather challenging. At this point, what he's trying to do is he's trying to help people let go of something they're obsessing about and do so in a graceful way. It is always, this is a challenge, right? Whenever you're talking to someone and you can see that they're doing something that isn't healthy and to give people a graceful way to change, that, um, that's not, not an easy thing to do. So we, we're going to be looking at both what Paul says and then the way Paul does it, because both the process... Uh, can teach us something about how we treat people, and then what he says also helps us understand something important about uh, king, uh, kingdom to come. So let's let's take a look at this. Uh, when he writes the set, what we now call Second Thessalonians, the second letter to the church at Thessalonica, he begins by telling them just like he did in the first, like establishing with them yet one more time how proud he is of them. Right. This is the, a genuine joy for them. He is praying for them. He, he cares for them deeply. That uh, He knows that they continue to suffer for uh, their faith, that they continue to catch flack for what is uh, their for following Jesus. And he knows this, and he respects the way they're holding on, even in the light of this. He, he reassures them that in the end there will be justice, so just keep on doing what you're doing. Paul tells them that he continues to pray for them, praying that they will be made fit for this task, being filled with all that God gives, all the good that God offers. Uh, and, and I'm certain this is true. Right? This is one of those moments that he, he's saying he's thankful for them, and I'm certain that he truly is thankful for them. Uh, he will be frustrated with them in a minute, but he is also deeply thankful. I mean, he's, saying he's talking to a group of people who have chosen to follow Jesus. This is, this is something wonderful. Paul then comes to the top he doesn't, he doesn't want to talk to about, but has to. Um, so he starts out the letter by being thankful and praying for them, and then he just he grabs the bull by the horns. And he tells them up front, don't get excited about this. We're going to talk about it, but, but don't get ahead of me. You know, just, just don't get excited about this. The call, right? Yes, Jesus will return. We will be gathered when that happens. It hasn't happened yet. And there's sort of an implied sense of, just like I told you in the last letter, when Jesus hasn't returned. I told you before, and I'm telling you the exact same thing now, right? Still hasn't happened. Really. No matter what anyone says. Even if you think I said it. right? Because Paul, uh, he uses the exact wording, is no... Uh, even if by message or letter, as if from us. Like, Paul doesn't know why they're continuing to obsess about this. What is the new grist for the mill that's causing them to, to have something new to worry about? And, and he doesn't know, so he's having to, like, was it something I said? Was Did, did something I say get misinterpreted, a message or a letter, as if from us? It No, that's not what I meant, so... Please, no matter what you think I meant, let me tell you, I did not mean that Jesus has already returned. Um, and, and so he's trying to head that off. <clears throat> Paul then continues, If anyone tells you otherwise, they're really not helping you. They're just getting you riled up. 
again, this is Paul doesn't know why they're obsessing now. So if if you think it was something I said, it wasn't me. And if someone else is trying to get you riled up about this, looking at the um, believing Jesus has come already, no, don't don't believe them. They're either they're trying to get you riled up. Don't let anyone deceive you. And this this idea like this is a weighty thing to say that like someone could be deceiving, lying to you. Um, Paul then tells them what they need to see first. Like the reason we know that Jesus has not returned is we haven't seen things like the apostasy, the man of lawlessness, lawlessness the son of destruction who exalts himself and sits in the temple. Um, now we know that these are references back to places like Daniel 11.36 and Ezekiel 28.2 referring to moments it's in Daniel when Antiochus fourth Epiphanes uh, desecrates the temple in Jerusalem uh, in Ezekiel 28 we read about the king of Tyre setting himself up as God uh, these type of events had happened before uh, so there's kind of a sense from looking at Jewish history they kind of had a sense of what they're looking for but we really don't know enough about this to have an opinion worth having right um, we don't know and, and right here uh, Paul breaks into a, a moment of, of brief but very clear frustration. Right? It, it, it comes through and it helps us uh, understand what's happening quite a bit. He says, Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you all these things? Like, this feels like the teacher who gets up in front of the class and sa having to reach reteach something for the third time and doing so and being patient with, with the children, but having at least one moment of, you know, this, this is the third time I've told you the same thing. You, you really might want to pay attention this time, right? I've, I've told you before, come on folks. Right? And, and this gets at why this passage is so hard to understand. We are looking in on one half of discussion that we weren't there for the start of. We weren't there when Paul was teaching about how to interpret Daniel 11 and Ezekiel 28. Like, we just, we don't know what Paul was looking for. We don't know how, what Paul was looking for. How does it relate to what happened with uh, Antiochus IV, or king of, the king of Tyre, back then in Jewish history? We don't know how, like, Paul held that together. And, um... Paul is not attempting to reteach in this letter either. Paul is not like saying, now let me teach you again from square one, right? Paul is not giving them the whole thing. Paul is, is like referencing what he has already taught them, right? Remember this, right? And by saying this, he's sort of evoking the whole block of data that he had given them while he was with them in person for multiple weeks. And, and so we, we, Paul is not trying to teach again. Paul is trying to evoke and then... Uh, reassure and help them understand that they don't need to be worried about this. So uh, anyone who's taking this letter and saying, ah, this is how we understand what's going to happen in the future. That's not what Paul is getting at here. That, uh, to use this as some sort of predictor of, of future events is, is to abuse uh, the letter and, and what Paul was trying to do. Like if we had what Paul had taught originally and, and Thessaloniki, that, or Thessalonica, that would be a different matter. But we don't. And I wish we did. That's a shame, though. So Paul continues and says, you know, Jesus has not returned. There are things beyond our understanding at work here. He says there is the mystery of lawlessness. And I think it's important to remember that when he says mystery, he means mystery. We don't understand. Uh, there will be false wonders which will draw attention to uh, what's happening. Um, yeah, we don't understand what that really means either. Paul continues and says in verse 8 that this is in the future, that the Lord will make all things right, and this is a good thing, and that those who have taken pleasure in um, persecution will be judged in this time, but they will not be deceived, as in you may have been deceived about this before, but get back on the straight and narrow, this is how we need to understand it, you will not be deceived again, you will endure just as you have, just as I've been praying for you to continue to do, this is in your future. It's a future that hasn't happened. So chill. Don't worry about it. Paul wraps up this section by praying for them. For those who may go through this future, or may not, like we don't know when it's going to happen. 
I mean, you may be, you may sleep in the Lord, as Paul uh, describes death before it happens. Praying that they might stand firm on the trend traditions which they are taught. Again, notice that past tense. Paul is telling them to stand firm on the traditions that they they have been taught, not are being taught. There's not anything new they need to learn here. They've been taught what they need to know. And what that tells them is that Jesus has not returned. Look for it. You'll know it when it happens. It hasn't happened yet, or else there would be absolutely no, no question about it, right? And then the last words of this topic, on this topic, uh, Paul prays, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and give us, given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. In the end, Paul is reminding them of what they were taught so that they might stand on it, being reassured, comforted, being at peace. Not because they fully understand. Paul doesn't. The people of the church at Thessalonica don't, uh, didn't. We don't either. But finding peace and knowing that they will know the day of the Lord when it happens, it's going to be crystal clear. And until that day, obsessing about it isn't healthy. Yes, learn, study, understand as much as we can, pay attention. But there are other more pressing uh, subjects to focus on. And Paul hints at that just with how he wraps up this. He talks about uh, every good work and word. And you can make, make a guess what his next topic is going to be. I'm going to focus on, on that work thing. And so we can see that in the very nature of how Paul addresses this, this topic, it reminds them that they, they need to, both be able to let this be the good news, right? Not something to obsess about, but be able to say, you know what, the the kingdom is coming, Jesus will return, and we'll get to it when we get when we get to it. And and we can see how he has uh handled it, right? That we have seen there that there is something about how to handle challenging topics. Right? He he in the first letter, he had helped taken this challenging topic and says uh, take this good news and use it to re reassure each other. And, and in this letter, he has said, take take this topic and uh, let's find something more healthy to focus on. And he's about to go to that healthier thing to focus on, that more pressing issue that they need to focus on, the thing that we'll be looking at next week. But so there, there's this way he doesn't he doesn't dodge a hard topic. He doesn't shame people he's talking to. He's not insulting for them. He is thankful and he prays for them and he is gracefully attempting them to redirect them. I mean, and again, this is one of the hardest things to do, uh, to help people have graceful ways to change their mind, graceful ways to act differently and, and to do it out of a sense of, of love and compassion and, and patience, even in the midst of frustration, because we can tell Paul is rather frustrated. It, it shines through in, a, in that one moment. All right. And I think it worked. I think it worked. Like, I think what Paul does here made sense and, and, and the people understood and they got it. And, and I say that based on the simple fact that we have this letter. If it hadn't worked, we wouldn't have this letter because they would have tossed it as, you know what, Paul... Paul, I mean, if you think about the, the church, right? Paul taught us something, we followed it, and if Paul had not been convincing these letters, they would have fallen away and, and, and ditched these letters. Now, these letters worked. Like, they helped the church find a way to reassure each other and, and to be able to focus on, on what they need to focus on and let this be important, but let, let, not let it be something that they obsess over. And so, first... Uh, it is important to, to, as I said, to notice the process that Paul uses. And second, just to take another swing at the topic, to understand that um, this is something we need to think about, right? death, the kingdom to come. But in the end, Paul tells us this is not something to obsess over. We reassure each other with the good news of, of what will come. But in the end, we have other things to work on. We have other things to, to uh, focus on that as Paul prays for that church and as Paul, uh, I believe, would pray for us, as I know I pray for us. But uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen us so that we might then focus on every good work and word. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, help us to be graceful with each other, as patient as Paul, loving, having a hope and a confidence, and being able to love each other day by day, uh, believing that we can and we will grow in understanding. We pray that you would guide us to focus on you, to focus on uh, what we see Paul focused on, to be able to say that the kingdom is coming, and there's much that we then have to do today, that today we'll have plenty to fill, fill us to be doing your good work. We pray for those who are suffering with COVID as that continues to be a problem. We give thanks that we can, can we have been able to begin to worship safely here, uh, and we pray for those who still yearn to be able to be gathered. We pray for all these things in your name. Amen. I uh, hope that next week the technology treats me a little bit better, and uh, I hope you have a good, good Sabbath.